Tata, you and I have lived together in this house now for nearly 60 years. Yeah. But what I'm really interested in is the time before that. You know, Lak Mahal was built in 1937. Uh, you came here, I think, a few years later. And then you married in 48. Can you tell me what the house was like with C.L. Vikram Singh and my grandfather? You know, one of the most distinguished civil servants. It must have been interesting for you to meet him. A large house with so many bedrooms, sitting rooms, and quite large for Colombo at that time. Uh, with an area of about 90 perches when the house was built. When he bought it, the servants quarters were there. Eight rooms for the Muttus, who looked after the horses of the owner of the right. property. But he didn't break that down. He built the big house in front, leaving that for our servants. Right. So the servants, from the beginning, had a room each. Right. No housekeepers though. No, no. No horses, right. And the uh, area in front yeah. was main use up for the big house, mm -hmm. leaving it a large lawn in front and on the side. It was a pretty fair, only big house for Colombo with room for all the children and several other rooms, very well furnished and quite a good home. Did he architect it himself? I know there was an architect, but the design was yeah, his. There was so a uh, Parsi architect, Gilmoria, right. yeah. was responsible for it. And the building was constructed by one of his own brothers, Basil Nikama Zinger, who was uh, in the PWD. Right. Yeah, he had eight brothers, no? No, seven he brothers. had seven brothers. He was the eighth male. Right. The eldest was a lawyer. Mm -hmm. Second was a proctor. Third was a postmaster. Fourth was an excise inspector. Right. Fifth was himself a civil servant. Sixth was a doctor. Seventh was a PW inspector. And the eighth was a doctor. So really they were all in government service. Yeah. But Cyril was probably the most distinguished of the lot. Oh yes. First, uh, Ceylon is civil servant to be given the post of assistant government agent and later government agent. Mm -hmm. Before that it was all Europeans. Right. So when was that? That was mm -hmm. 20s or 30s? Or? He joined the civil service in 1912. Right. And 1925, he was appointed assistant government agent Mana. Right. And he was got the responsibility of having a pearl fishery. Right, yes. And your mother was born in 1925. And Dr. Nell, who was a great orientalist, right. told my father in law to call him Mukta, the, the Sanskrit word for pearl. Right. So, so she was conceived in Mana. Uh, right. And then the other children? Esmond was born when he was magistrate in Jaffna. Right. This, sir, I think when he was in a mother place, I forget where, Mukta, Mana, and Lakshman, in, they were in Galamu. But all, the, all of them were born in Kurunagara, in the mother in law's place. Ah, the old place. Actually, that must have been quite interesting because Cyril himself was not from an old family. But my grandmother was. Not so old. Not so grandmother. Right. But he was from an old family. Right. But his wife's family was a Christian from about 1820. Right. From the time the British went to the Kandyan provinces. Right. And colonialism was always followed with missionaries. Mm. And generally, all people took up the religion of the government. Right. Then but of course, mind. your youngest brother-in-law, my youngest uncle, was an Anglican bishop, Lakshman. He was brought up as an Anglican. Right. And very devoted from his early days. Mm -hmm. And was thinking of the church from a very early time. Mm. Now he was obviously highly respected when he died 30 years highly ago. Highly respected, high churchman. 
Right. What were the other brothers like? I mean, your friend was actually... This sir. Right. The second brother who was about my age. Right. And he was my friend with whom I used to come to this house. So that's how you came here? Yes, well, he says, Sam gave me as my friend and told my sister. <laughs> right. So when did you first meet them? 1941, Royal Tomian match. Right. So... March. Mom would have been about 16. She was 15 plus. Right. Hearing, yeah, wearing a half sari, Kandyan sari, yeah. and cheering lustily for the brother. He played in that match? Yeah. Right. yeah. Kissa was a great hitter. Right. He scored about 20 or 28 runs in about two overs. Right. He was not an elegant batsman, but a good hitter. Now, he was a bit of a rascal, I mean, a lovely person, oh, yes, but yes, yes. very kind to it. Yes, good sportsman. He had cricket colours, rugby colours and tennis colours. Mm -hmm. And Lakshman had rugby colours, tennis colours and... Athletics was his very athletics, forte. Yes. That was his very forte. Yeah. And the eldest brother? The eldest Isn't brother it? was a politician from the beginning. Right. Part, taking part in Sri Lanka, LSSP. And he had to go with them. And he had a very good friend from Kandy, a Muslim, who went as his bodyguard whenever he went on this political... That was Rafiq, right? Rafiq. Yeah. But he was in the LSSP, so the Trotskyist party. Yeah. I was told by Reggie Sirivartana, once years afterwards, yeah. you know, Reggie was also a great leftist, and we were sitting in the garden downstairs. Yeah. And he said that the jailbreak, you know, when an emperor and all broke out of jail, mm. was planned here. Could that be true? Possibly, I said an exaggeration. Possibly, yes. So my grandfather was a pillar of the British establishment, and his eldest son was a radical revolutionary. Yeah. But then Esmond changed considerably, no? I mean, he, he became a pillar of the UNP. How did that happen? Well, he married Dia Vijayawadana's daughter. And when Dia Vijayawadana lied, he left an estate of 200,000 rupees. One of the leftist papers said, Esmond's father-in-law left an estate of 200,000. No wonder that he was a communist. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, essentially, Dia wanted him to run the newspaper yes. in China because he was the because most efficient of the sons-in-law. Three sons-in-law. Right. Of the three of them, the most educated was Esbon with a very good second upper in history honours from London right. and an advocate. Lal was also an advocate but of sorts and Gomez was a businessman. Mm -hmm. So Esbon was the most eligible to run the paper. Right. And when DFL in about 1947, 48, mm -hmm. he appointed Esbon to head, be head of the organization. Right. And it's been basically ran it for 20 years, am I right? Oh, yes, yes. Up till... But he brought to journalism a new angle. Right. And the payment of the staff was increased and Tazi Vittachi was one of the most capable editors. And he had a large number of people who were very well trained. But Tarsi, who was your friend initially, yeah. has written that after No, he one day before I got married, when I came here for lunch, mm -hmm. this man asked me, you are in the university hostel, can you suggest somebody to be taken in for editorial training? Mm -hmm. That very evening, Tarsi came with his wife and we were seated on the lawn in the hostel. And I asked him about this. He said, I'll take it. Right. But I said it was with difficulty that we got you into the bank of Ceylon. Hmm. He said, Sam, I'm sick of looking after the people's money. <laughs> so he don't make cows and within a month he was accepted as a very good journalist. Yeah. And then he rose from that to be editor hmm. in some Malaysian papers and became one of the leading newspaper men in Ceylon. No, no, he was excellent. Yeah. But I, he did write an article once for me, you know, when I did the New Lankan review about his times at Lake House. Mm. And he said that after he wrote an article critical of the UNP, mm. Esmond transferred him, sent him to London. Of course, Esmond was never cruel, so he sent him to London as 
you know, which was considered a very prestigious yeah. place. But Tarsi said it was to get him out of the way. Do you think possible, that was possible? possible. Did Desmond see the newspapers as a very political tool? Oh, yes, tool? yes. He used the newspaper for large for political purposes. Right. So, was the, were the newspapers always very anti the SLFP? You know, now in '56 when Banda came in, uh, I know that Tazi used to lampoon Banda. Wonderful column, but he lampooned everybody. Yeah. You know, Tazi was no respect of any person. But do you feel that Esmond and the editorial policy was, even from the start, very negative about the SLFP? Yes. So, it do you think. SLMP was neither leftist nor UMP, it was a kind of middle of the way party. Right. So and where he had the Sangavedu Guru Govikamka, right. those people who were a lower level in society, Buddhist monks, Anvedic presidents, Ayurvedic <laughs> teachers, Sangavedu Guru. So would you Farmers. see that as really in a sense an emerging class, whereas Esmond was on the side of the elites, the old Colombo dominant no, people but who had dominated he society. Was the elitist leftist. An elitist leftist. Because of course the contrast with Lakshman was considerable because Lakshman was known as the people's bishop. Of yeah. course that was later. Mm -hmm. So do you think of course as I said I the fifties I didn't really, really know about. When I came to political consciousness was the 60s, when of course Lake House had this massive battle against the SLFP. And of course in addition to the political hostility, there was of course the very funny fact that Esmond's son Ranil Vikramasinghe and Mrs. Bandranaka's son Anurabhadranaka who were in school together and such good friends, they also tended to part because of this hostility between Lake House and the SLFP. What was that about? Well, they are stood for the establishment. Right. Whereas this one was destructive. Right. So that was a difference. Right. But he was a great supporter of Jaya Jaya right? Oh, yes. Right. His wife's cousin. Of course. And in 1956, when the UNP lost the election, it was Jaya. And Esmond who built up the party, isn't oh that the yes. case? They sat down uh, in the defeat. A lot of people thought that the UNP will get wiped out. Right. But from scratch, they resuscitated the whole thing and worked hard. Went to the people, and wooed them. Mm. And Jaya was the man, really, architect of the recovery. He opposed, us, opposed anybody who was against him. Right. But one of the other people I've been told who was part of that build up was Cyril Matthew. He also Cyril was a great Cyril Matthew friend. was a great supporter of Jaya. Right. And Cyril Matthew was a man who was against most things. Right. Very effective man from right. his particular community. And he, I think, was responsible for the destruction of the Jaffna Library also. Because Ranil, of course, made an extraordinary speech after July 83, saying that the Tamils really hadn't suffered so much as the Sinhalese had under Bandaranaika nationalism. You know, nationalization, not nationalism, nationalization of their, you know, the petit bourgeois companies, which suggests an almost Pujadist, you know, very chauvinistic view of Sri Lanka for the Sinhalese. And I would find that odd. Lesman would not have been so exclusivist. But he was born to privilege, right? And he should extend the privileges to other people also. Yeah, no, he was a very warm hearted man. This, you know, the very fact that you ended up living here, you know, they had three sons, but yeah. you as the son in law have ended up living in this house, and I have benefited because I have lived here for 60 years. How did that happen? happened because when I got married, the three brothers yeah. of your mother said, we have been living here from our inception and we don't want to live here. So if you're marrying our sister, you have to come here and live here and look out our mother. <laughs> I had three houses which I had gathered for my three children. 
but I had to come and live here, as, as we call a minna married man, living in the wife's house. And of course your mother-in-law, who was widowed in 1945, lived nearly 50 years longer. Yeah. She was, she was 94 when she died, right. born in 1900, got married at 19. Right, yes. No, extraordinary, beautiful lady. Yeah, very dignified. Very gracious. But it must have been quite tough, you know, living in her house. No, yeah. we got on very well. Right. I think one of perfect example of the son-in-law and mother-in-law getting on well, because she was in that part of the house, mm -hmm. we were here. Hard interview with us. And sometimes when we were newly married, we used to go out for dinner very often. Um, one day, one of you left a little note on our dressing table. Please, mum, have dinner with us, so called so. <laughs> right. Yes, no, you had a very heavy social life in those days when we were young. And the longest time you spent away from this, of course, was in Canada yeah. when you went to McGill and we all went with you. What happened in the house in that time? Did she continue by herself? By himself, right. yeah. With the servants right. and uh, missed us, but he managed. Of course, she was younger than I am now. I mean, she was only in her fifties at the time. Yeah, she was forty-eight. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. What was it like socially in those days? You know, there were obviously very well, Western oriented My grandfather was a member of the Orient Club. Right. And your grandmother was a member of the Women's International Club. Mm -hmm. So she used to go very often to the club where these Columbus own ladies met together and gossiped. Right. She and her others were indulging in a conversation at a high level. Right. And they played bridge most of the time. Well, they were great bridge players. I mean, I learned my bridge from them, which held yeah. me in Woodstead at university. Were you roped in? Hmm? Do you ever play bridge with them? I never played card games. Right. And your wife, of course, my, my mother, was not a club person at all. No. no. She, spent she her was life. essentially a girl guide. Right. She became commissioner, chief commissioner, and were represented in the world committee. Took a great interest in guiding. Well, sometimes I think, you know, she needed an outlet because it couldn't no, have been yes. easy living in this house with her mother who was a gracious but very strong personality. And I know that when people said she's... To her, black and white never mixed up. Right. But not black or white. They had nothing in between. Yeah. I remember once you told me a wonderful story about how you used to post letters for her. <laughs> yeah. What happened? She used to give me letters and one day when she was in the car, she went to put a cubicle and found some letters there. Which had forgotten to post. Yeah. yeah. So he used to send grenades to post. And he had the habit of sending grenades to post each letter. <laughs> right. So I used to tell grenades that he did not get in trouble because whatever he gathered in the night was wasted on the road the next day. Posting her letters. Yes. Gunaris was one of the old servants who I think was here when I was born. Yeah. And you know, you started by talking about the area at the back. And there was a wonderful collection of servants there yeah. who have gone on over the because years. Because they stayed with us. Mm. Generally people had problems because servants leave. Yeah. But they had room each at the back. And we gave them mosquito nets and things like that. They had a pretty easy life. There's no Ekman who is still here. Almost 57 years here. Right. He was uh, the boy when I came to consciousness, about 60. But then, of course, he got a job at Lake House. Esmen very kindly what gave him a job. What happened he came here, yeah. mainly to look out to book my books in the library. Right. When I abandoned the Attorney General's department and went to Parliament, mm. I devoted this time to the law books. So Esmen gave me a job at Lake House. And he worked there for 50 years. Yes. But then he stayed on here, I mean, after he retired, which is nice to have him. Yeah. And now we have his family here. All servants stayed yeah. long. Because we looked after them very well. All medical expenses, clothes were given, had good rooms. The work was light. And the daughter now, you know, as Ekman's daughter, Lake House offered her a job when he retired. Yes. Now she is a sort of semi-staff officer. Right. Working in the doctor's department. Right. 
And in the kitchen, she is called the roaster lady. <laughs> <laughs> because she gives uh, yeah. uh, medicine to the rest of the staff. And I got her to bring her son yeah. and kept him here and put in the child into ladies' college and then enrolled. No, that's very good to give him a, a, a good future. I think that's very important. And of course, her brother is also here, so we have four members of the family. Fifth one got married and went away. Yes, yes. She married my driver's cousin, which was a very good example of internal romance. Yes. But what was it like? I mean, you came from Gatamana, it's yeah. a beautiful village in the south, but very different from oh, yes, Kalamba yes. society. I always say I was born in the village. Right. Yeah, my father had land and belly fields and we depended entirely on those products. Coconut, rubber and citronella yes. and cinnamon. He so bit of a tough old gentleman who ran away from work when he was in the eighth grade. After but he made sure you came to Colombo School. Oh yes, yes. He took a lot of trouble over the Yes, he died when you were quite young, no? He died the year I joined the university. Right. When you weren't you planning to go to England? I had a place in Cambridge, but war time. Right. My mother said, "Who gets into a ship in the war?" Right. And I had to stop that. So what I missed, I did for my three children by sending them all to Oxford. Right. And you did your degree here, but also yeah. did law. Oh, I went to the university, then to the law college, joined the attorney general department, got called to the bar in England, went to Canada and did my law, LLM, and generally had a good time. Why did you decide in 1963, when you went to the AGIS department and quite senior, to go into Parliament, you know, the Secretary General. You know, with the Solbury Constitution, yeah. <coughs> Parliament, the State Council took a new turn. We are getting independence. Right. And they wanted in Parliament mm -hmm. somebody with judicial experience and who could be the head of the Secretariat. Right. Ralph Derenegal, of course, he needed to be, was a barrister who was a Crown Counsel in the Ministry of Justice. And he, when he retired, they asked two people, Victor Tendakon and NADS Vijayasekhar, whether they would go there. Mm. They both said they are about to go on the bench right. and suggested me. Right. So they came here and asked me whether I would join. I said, yes, I will join. join if I am paid as permanent secretary's salary. Right. From, from his, that's why I went to Parliament, because staying in Hartdorf, I have been a judge and as a judge you can't do anything very much. Right. But in Parliament I was in a better position. No, no, I have to say that now that I'm in Parliament myself, comparing with your days when I used to come as a little boy and watch, there's no dignity left. <coughs> yes. I made the job one of the best in Zilong. And some of the civil servants used to say the secretary Clark was a class two civil service job, but you have made it the best job in the public service. <laughs> That's well, entirely because I took decisions with my judicial experience. And you could justify that? Yes, sir, son. Very often you have to intervene the you are the legal advisor to the speaker. And very often you have to take decisions which are against the government. But I got away with that. No, because I think when the lake house bills were coming up yeah. and the speaker made a decision that seemed anti the government. Yeah. People blamed you saying you were Esmond's brother in law. Yes. Yeah. They said the Secretary General is the Lake House brother in law. <laughs> right. But Mrs. Bandranak had faith in you, right? No, so, when I was the day I was confirmed. Yes. She was in Delhi. They telephoned to Delhi and said this happening. He, he said I knew that boy long before he became the my <laughs> brother case. was my roommate in the hostel. Right. Of course. That was Mackie or Barnes? Barnes. Who became a judge. And of course on some occasions, you know, especially when she was in opposition, I think you have told me you saved her from Jaya Jayavadna's little tricks when he tried to have committees of inquiry against her. Yes. 
Jaya Javadan asked a question about uh, car given by the Justin Kotala was an insurance company and they are alleged in the question that it was a bribe to prevent her to taking the insurance company. I was the secretary to that committee. I phoned up her, this company and asked the secretary to send me the finish book. Right. To see whether there was any director's decision to nothing. Right. And kept the book and when JR came to give evidence against yeah. Bandar Nayaka, I asked him whether there was a decision to give the car. Mm. He said there may be. Mm. I gave him the book and said, see the minutes, nothing. Mm. The only thing in the minutes was payment to Rollins right. for a car. Right. Which was given to the boss of the insurance company mm -hmm. for him to gather advertisements for middleways which was Kotarawada's company. Right. And middleways got a commission on all the advertisements and the amount earned within that time was over a hundred thousand in commissions to middleways which was five times more than the price of the car. So Ultimately, and it was registered in Mandar Naika's name as head of the CLFP mm. because they were frightened that the manager might take away the car, go away with the car. and they went to the Minister of Justice, whose daughter was married to Kutalawala's son, right. and persuaded him to persuade Mr. Bandar Naika to be a owner. Right. She had never seen the car. Right. So, at the end of it, Judge was in, in the report said due to the very search tools cross-examination on the witness by the secretary, I said, sir, don't put that in the report because I don't want to go down to posterity as the <laughs> responsible. So, he removed that. Right. But Mrs. Bandar Naika always thought that they are saved. Really? Right. Well, that wasn't the occasion when Jaya told you, Sam, if you hadn't been so sharp, I would have got away with it. I think you told me a story once. Ah, yes, 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 yes. He yeah. asked a question. There was a commission appointed to the CWE, where the commissioner was a retired Supreme Court right. judge. And one of the opposition members criticized hmm. the interim report saying that you can't criticize it because the judicial mm. inquiry mm. and under the standing orders you can't criticize the judicial mm. inquiry. I promptly wrote a note to the speaker that under the Commissions of Inquiry Act, mm. it, the, it is a judicial inquiry so far as contempt is concerned, mm. but it is not an inquiry in which there is a decision between subject and subject or subject and the state. Mm. So, the speaker said, Sam Jair is facing it. Mm. I said, don't worry, this is the correct position. He upheld it. Mm. Then I went to my chambers to see that the steno had taken down properly. Mm. Invokes there. Mm. And he says, Sam, I saw what happened. If you were not there, I would have got away with it. <laughs> <laughs> no, the real tragedy now in Parliament is none of the officials. A, will have the courage to make such decisions. B, I don't think they understand. You know, we had an extraordinary situation the other they, day. There, they are were new government advocates with a little experience. I went there after 15 years as a ground counsel. Right. So I could take decisions. Now, right. for instance, the Kalavan case. Hmm. Ultimately, yeah, I said, I, mean, I said, tell Kalavan management to resign. He said, then you have to report the vacancy. Hmm. I said, no. The Secretary General has to report the vacancy, not anybody else. Mm. And if a Secretary General, I don't think there is a vacancy, I won't report. But he said, no, every vacancy shall be reported. Mm. I said, no, every vacancy shall be reported if there is vacancy. Yeah. If there is no vacancy, I will have to report. 
No, that actually saved him from the rather yeah. stupid thing he was trying to do, no? to have two then members for Kalawan. Then he the thing and said, I made the constitution, you are interpreting for Tony. He was, uh, he was rather cynical, no? clever yeah. man but very cynical. How would you contrast him with Dudley, Senator? I never got involved in those politics. Right. Then there was a man who got elected mm -hmm. early, mm -hmm. but he got power quite late. That's so he was a late comer to power. And I think he didn't want to give it up ever, no? I think that was the tragedy. He felt he was much more deserving than Dundee, but right. Dudley was more popular in the country. Right. And perhaps deservedly. Hmm? Perhaps deservedly. From what I've seen, Dudley, though not perhaps so efficient, would never have engaged in excesses, and I don't think he would have allowed the riots of July 1983. But I see, Dudley was a better human being. Right. Yeah, was not. You said Dudley was a good human being. How would you rate Mrs. Bandranaka? Who? Mrs. Bandranaka. Very good lady. She was ready to listen and never did anything immoral or like that. Very often I have heard her turning on the telephone and somebody said, they took some lands of a UNP. Mm. He said, what? Mm. You think UNP people can't hold land? Mm. She was a very fair. Easy that one. And she was very fair. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we've spoken over a lot of things. Mm.